Hi, uh, my name is Katherine Miller, and today I'll be presenting on my current PhD research, Understanding Anglo-Saxon Burial Practice Patterns Through Radiocarbon Dating, a Case Study of Southern England. Um, as this project is still ongoing, any feedback, questions, or discussion is very much welcome. As I mentioned in the title, the time period for this project is centered during the Anglo-Saxon period of England, or maybe roughly between 450 to 800 AD. Much debate has been had concerning the extent of the migratory patterns of Anglo-Saxons into England. A more traditional view of this is when the Roman government and the army were pulling out of England around 410 AD, it left England vulnerable. The estimated date of arrival for European factions began roughly around 450 AD. But as to how many entered and how violent this entrance was is one of the largest questions we early medievalists are trying to answer. The migration question has also been aided by the lack of first-hand accounts. Many of the contemporary individuals, such as Bede and Gildas, and were written generations after the arrivals of Anglo-Saxons. Much of what we know from this period is from the archaeology, particularly in the southwest of England. In utilizing archaeology and Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, we can begin to understand the cultural richness and diversity during this period. The cemeteries are one of the many features that cultural populations use to mark their existence in a region. Anglo-Saxons express their cultural and religious identity through burials of its people. Examining grave sites with mixed practices and rites um, will help to unravel the commingling of these many cultures that enter England. On the slide, I've listed a few of the many features, many burial styles that could be present within an Anglo-Saxon burial site. Two of the main time periods I want to focus on that are pertinent to my project. I'll discuss two of the main periods that I want to focus on in this project. The first being the sixth and the fifth and sixth century. We mostly see field cemeteries that could contain trench burials with stone, as well as that contain probably a variety of burial position, grave alignments, and proportion of goods. The second being the seventh and eighth century, where burials are sometimes furnished with clothing, weapons, jewelry. When thinking of this, we can consider this maybe final phase. We think of places like Sutton Hoo, Prittlewell, those more lavish places. We also begin to see um, burial mounds, which are probably more than more wealthier people, kind of creating their monument in the landscape. As well, we see a stark contrast with some graves having no goods and quite plain overall. Although there is some pattern concerning chronology and burial practice, there is much, much more variety and commingling of practices within cemetery. This thought is what ultimately sparked interest for my project. The crux for this project was to conduct a radiocarbon survey of three Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, Apple Downs and Droxford from the kingdom of the region of Wessex or South Central England, and Pilgrim's Way from the region of Kent or Southeastern England. By conducting a radiocarbon survey on individual cemeteries that contained a variety of burial styles, I wanted to see if there was any chronology chronological sequence or pattern to the varying practices within one cemetery or population sample. In addition to looking at burial practices and chronology, I wanted to examine the relative dates from the archaeological goods and how they fared alongside the variety of carbon dates, exploring that relative versus absolute. Thirdly, how did these dates fit into the historical accounts from Bede and Gildas and others, and how these somewhat contemporary sources fit into the archaeological narrative? By utilizing osteology, chemistry, History and archaeology, I wanted to gain a better understanding of how cultural practices changed over time as the population was changing in England. I began my project by going through collection databases and reading through many Anglo-Saxon cemeteries and burial sites. I ultimately chose cemeteries based on, size, on their size and diversity of burial practices, with Apple Downs being on the larger size and Doxford and Pilgrim's Way being on the smaller end. After the selection of these three sites, I began choosing various burial, burials for radiocarbon dating. I wanted to choose graves that were overlapping each other in varying alignments, i.e. north-south versus east-west, to see if there was any sort of temporal difference between these features. In addition to the differing alignments, I chose graves from across the cemetery rather than one locus point, as this would probably give a better timeline for the cemetery. Lastly, the amount of goods within the graves played into the selection. I chose graves that were in a range of richness, some of the graves containing lots of graves while some containing none. Having this amount of datable good within graves is an essential for the radiocarbon dating process and for further interpretations. Last, as, skeletal, um, as for my skeletal samples, I chose small fragments from long bones and the skull, as this contains the most compact or hard bone. 
This compact bone thickness is crucial for gathering radiocarbon dates. I also chose fragments versus taking samples from long bones, as this is a destructive process and not wanting to further damage any further articulated bones. Finding fragments for sampling was really e fairly easy at Apple Downs and Droxford, as they were buried in a more clay-like soil, which helped with preservation. While P Pilgrim's Way was a much more chalky soil, which turned the bone into a chalk-like material, which kind of sucks out all the carbon and isotopes and stuff, making it difficult to sample. As for my radiocarbon method, um, I analyzed my samples at University of Bristol, and I followed a very similar procedure to Oxford. Some background on how we can tell the age of an individual from carbon-14 levels is carbon is absorbed by an organism in the atmosphere, from the atmosphere, and once an organism dies, uh, that level of carbon-14 begins to decrease. And thank you to some clever chemists, we know that rate of decay. And we can use grab that sample, uh, grab that level, through graphitization and breaking down that bone sample and sending it through the accelerators, the accelerating mass spectrometer machine, which is a big fancy word for magnets that we program to pull out certain isotopes. Um, and then we plug it into OxCal, which is this kind of statistical program that Oxford came up with, and we can grab that level or that BP date and turn it into a calendrical date. Thus, the calendrical date you see a lot of time in radiocarbon process is actually the date of death rather than date of living because it's when that radiocarbon started to decay. Also, there is a large plateau in the radiocarbon curve during this period, um, which can make it quite difficult to get a narrow range of an, a, the death of an individual. Thus, Bayesian model statistics using, utilizing artifactual dates as the known have played an important role in the, these narrowing these large ranges. Uh, the relative dates that have been most useful have been the knife typology by Eason and Bruner and the spearhead typology by Swanton, due to the plethora of these items at each site. Um, the relative dates I am using were collected by the original excavators of each site and then comparing the originals with the original text with Eason and Swanton. Now that I've given a bit of background on my methodologies and a bit of history, I'll jump into the specific details of my site and project. Uh, the first site I chose was Apple Downs. Apple Downs was originally excavated by Downs and Welsh in the 1990s and is located near Compton in Chichester County, kind of South Central England. The one that's um, Apple Downs is comprised of two cemeteries that contain roughly 121 individuals between them. The first cemetery is kind of that more later Saxon period, rows of east-west alignment, little to no goods, while Cemetery 2, which is where I focus most of my efforts, has that, those varying alignments, ranging in richness, cremation, inhumations, um, and holding the bulk of all the individuals. This is the largest and most studied of the three cemeteries I will be examining. Uh, for example, Dr. Alex Bayless and Dr. John Hines have published three radiocarbon dates, along with Dr. May and Dr. Beaven, who have done some stable isotopes on those samples as well. This has been helpful because it's been provided almost a parameter for error for me to see where my data lies compared to theirs. As you can see, I have already carbon dated 10 individuals from this site. There is a, both a mixture of males and females, with mostly adults and one child and one adolescent. Um, as you can see, they're dating mostly between the later 5th century and 7th century, again, based on varying um, relative dates like the knife, and typolo knife typologies and spearhead typologies. The second site I chose was Droxford, which is located in Hampshire County on the River Mound, again, in south-central England. So, Droxford and London, again, maybe a little here, just to give some geographical reference. This site was originally excavated by Dale in the early 1900s and then was re-excavated by Adelsworth in the 1970s. Besides Dale's and Adelsworth's account, it has also been thought that the current village of Droxford might have been the mid to late, Sa mid to late Saxon settlement of Drushenford mentioned in the Doomsday Book. The cemetery contains a total of 41 burials, yet it's thought to be much larger, but due to the large railway constructions that was happening in this area, much of it might have been destroyed. Again, I radiocarbon dated 10 individuals from this site. Like Apple Downs, there is a mixture of males and females. 
except this sample seems to be on the much younger range, mostly in their 20s with one child. Also, these individuals were found with a lot less dateable goods. Um, so, but interestingly, Droxford 19 was found with a mixture of both Anglo-Saxon metalworks and Roman pottery. The last site I chose was Pilgrim Way, which is closest to Warmth in Kent. So, another geographical reference is London would be more to the west of this. Um, again, due to the chalky soil, I was only able to radiocarbon date six of the individuals. Um, unlike this, unlike the other two, these are mostly males um, with one child and two possible females. Interestingly, though, we do have several burrow burials and one elite burial. Um, as you can see on this map, these the numbers you see here in the next graph be the grave, the burial numbers of the inhumations, and these are kind of the grave cut numbers. Um, but this one here is probably the most elite burial of all my surveys, 7067. On the next slide, it'll be 7068. And it contains a plethora of metalworks, including weapons, um, and has been really helpful for dating as well. Here are my um, individuals. I my six individuals, mostly males, females, adults, one. One adolescent, again, mostly later 6th, 5th century, 7th century. Um, at this time, I have finished my radiocarbon dating for the 26 individuals, and I have re ran samples with carbon 13 and <coughs> nitrogen 15 to kind of discount the marine reservoir effect. Uh, when radiocarbon dating anyone or any sample, an individual's diet must be taken into consideration. If an individual consumes a lot of fish, those nitrogen levels that they would have gotten from the fish can alter the dates and actually make them look a lot younger or a lot older than they actually might be. Um, thus, on my carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 readings, uh, these individuals would not have consumed any fish. They would have probably eaten mostly terrestrial uh, animals. As I mentioned earlier, due to the plateau and the radiocarbon curve during this period, a lot of my date ranges are a lot longer than you might expect compared to other, um, other samples studies, so mine are usually in between 100 to 150 years. As you can see um, on my table here, some of the relative dates are matching quite nicely to my radiocarbon dates, such as Apple Downs 18, Droxford 19, and Pilgrim's Way 7068 or Pilgrim's Way 7067. Yet some really aren't. Uh, the Apple Down and Droxford samples on average are a bit earlier from what I was expecting due to the fact they're falling more in the transitional period between the Romans and the Anglo-Saxons. This was interesting because Pilgrim's Way is falling within the stere that stereotypical period of the Anglo-Saxon period. But this dip in time in the Roman period could explain why there's Roman artifacts that drops for an apple downs rather than at Pilgrim's Way. Uh, here's a timeline I kind of created on Oxcal to demonstrate the kind of time difference. Um, as you can see, Pilgrim's Way is on the top far more to the right in that 500 to 700 range, whereas Droxford and Apple Downs and left hand are far more to the left hand side. As this project is still ongoing, I still have so many questions left. I'm hoping to discuss whether strontium oxygen would be helpful to understanding what's going on demographically. I want to see if we can use any, um, I want to see if we can use any see any difference between the individuals presenting earlier dates alongside the ones who are presenting Anglo-Saxon dates. Um, by using oxygen and strontium, this could help us better understand where these populations could have lived over their lives. As well as I'm interested in comparing Droxford and Apple Downs in contrast in more specific detail due to, their, um, to Pilgrim's Way due to their location in two different regions. Also, through their close proximity, Apple Downs and Droxford have an interesting relationship to one another. As you can see, as we can see, there's a relationship between these people and the Romans, considering there being Roman artifacts at Apple Downs and Droxford, in addition with their early dates. I want to see how these sites could play into the discussion of the interactions between Anglo-Saxons and the Romano-British. A big thank you to the people I've listed about. They've been tremendous help on this project so far, and I can't wait to see where it leads. I would love to hear your comments, questions, and concerns concerning this project. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me.